actually when the front pump got here, the house was pretty well involved in the front half, uh, coming out the roof, the front room, uh, where the victim was, was totally involved. Fire coming out the windows and the roof. We immediately laid an uh, inch and a half lines. And upon laying the lines, we were notified there was possible victims in the house. We removed one from the back, a crippled man, but was unable to get into the room in the front part of the house due to the intense heat and fire. Uh, actually, upon our arrival, there would have been to no avail. There was too much involved in fire and heat. No one live through. You're not but about six blocks away from here, right? True, about six blocks. Actually, when we pulled out of the station, you could see the black smoke rolling uh, from the fire itself. Was there anything at all you could do for this victim? No, nothing uh, that could be done. Or there was some lady in there that said the stove, some, something to do with the stove possibly uh, that caused the fire, which I don't know. It's under investigation now. It has the actual cause of the fire. District Judge Fred Harless ruled that the city could go ahead with its proposal to spend five and a half million dollars on the music hall, saying plaintiff's attorneys failed to show that a breakdown of costs in the music hall wasn't an official action of the city of Dallas. State Fair President Robert Cullum, who identified himself as being in the grocery business, told the court he had made up the half million dollar figure for proposed spending on the music hall. But Cullum said that figure represented only what he'd like to see spent on the music hall in relationship to the three-week-long state fair. City Attorney Alex Bickley kept plaintiff's attorney Bob Ewing going back and forth by insisting that Ewing keep to subjects that related to official city actions. Bickley told me after the hearing today that he'd recommend Monday that city councilmen start on the music hall project immediately. I advised city council previously that they could proceed until an injunction was granted, yes. And the situation today is that no injunction has been granted and apparently the council will go ahead with work. The uh, judge refused to grant a temporary injunction, yes. When the water in the Roosevelt Heights area came, came from this direction, came through here, this was about three and a half feet underwater. A lot of people run out of their homes in the Roosevelt Heights area. Today, the Interdenominational Ministerial Alliance of Dallas, of which the Reverend S.M. Wright is the president, began to what they call phase one of a consolidation program to help some of the victims of the Roosevelt Heights area. One of the victims they helped was Sam Fain. Mr. Fain, yes, what do these people give you today? Today, well, they give me just a full mattress and full mattress and bed to bed. Did you know that they were going to do it? No, sir, I didn't know they were going to do it. What did you lose in the, in the when the waters came up? Well, the water come up to this time, the last, last first time it come up in here, I lost everything. And this time I lost everything but I got your brother. What does this mean to you? It means a million, a million thousand dollars to me. Is it a pretty good Christmas present? It's the best Christmas present I ever had in my life. The Rolling Hills Evangelistic Center is presently located at 3909 Reed in Fort Worth. Its membership wants it in a more central location for the congregation. After surveys and studies, they picked this site at 2601 Pecos. There's only one trouble. The area is zoned A1 residential and e-commercial. To build a church in a residential area, you've got to have the specific approval of the city's zoning board of adjustment. After a public hearing, the Adjustments Board decided in view of neighborhood objections to the project to turn down the request for a building permit. The church then tried to get the zoning changed to CF, or Community Facilities, but the Fort Worth Zoning Commission turned them down. CF Community Facilities zoning allows for things other than a church, such as medical offices, rehabilitation centers, and other things which might be undesirable in the neighborhood. Therefore, I felt that probably if they did want to build a church in the area, that they should build it under the proper zoning of A1 family. Uh, we take the position that for years in Texas, the Supreme Court has assured 
the right in churches uh, subject to proper police protection and regulations to build in a residential area of any town and that the Supreme Court has always said that a city cannot by zoning ordinance deprive a church of being constructed in a residential section of town. The matter comes up before the Fort Worth City Council on January 10th. If the church gets no relief there, it appears they'll go to court against the Board of Adjustment. If the church should win in court, it could reinforce precedents that allow churches to build in residential areas without a lot of hassle. J. Lewis, Channel 8 News on the Move, Fort Worth. Jackie, you've played a variety of positions on defense, haven't you? Yes, I have. Tomorrow, what will be your assignment? My side will be to stay with number 11 wherever he goes most of the night and the, most of the support to run on the weak side. I move to the weak side, stay for the strong side this week. Now, who's number 11? Number 11, well, I don't know his name, but he's a good receiver, and uh, it's my job to keep up with him all, all day long. He's spit out, I gotta go with him. So that'd be my job, biggest job I have, I believe. He's a great receiver, he's really good, and the quarterback can throw the ball well. So I take care of him. You run up against some pretty good passers and some pretty good receivers in running up this impressive record, though, haven't you? Yes, sir, we have. I think the best pass we ran up against was a guy from Jacksonville, and he had some great receivers, and that gave us a real good, tough go, as you know. 18 to 17, that was rough. <laughs> what do you know about the uh, Gregory Portland defense and the men who will be opposite you? Well, they have a big tackle. He weighs about 230, and he's pretty tough, but I believe our, with our speed and our line and our backs, I believe we can break pretty quick. I don't know. Hit them for that. I know it. Hit them. <laughs> Do you think you'll be doing uh, much passing tomorrow or mostly running? I don't know. What, uh, I don't really know. Uh, probably if we have to, like in the Brownwood game, we had to, and, and it came through for us. Well, uh, I'll be blocking on linebackers this week. The defense they run, and uh, it's going to be pretty hard to cut them off because they, they flow real fast and they're real quick, and that's going to be a big thing for me is being able to get there quick enough, get off the line and cut them off. From the films that you have seen, what are your impressions of those uh, Wildcats down there close to Corpus? Oh, they they look pretty good to me. I, you know, got a lot of desire to win, and I think that's one thing we got on our side is a lot of character, you know, maybe the main thing we have. And if we get ready mentally, I believe we'll be able to, to beat them. Yeah, yeah, but, you know, that's, that's, I think that's the position of the future, and, uh, you know, I think especially since we have, in the past, you know, five or six games, gotten the passing game on track, then, you know, it looks like the trend for Coach Landry is to build a strong passing attack, and, you know, I'd like to get it, get in there. Uh, you look at the guys like Sanders and uh, the guy in Cincinnati, Qualic out in San Francisco, and, you know, all of these guys have real fast wide receivers, guys like Hayes and Allworth, uh, they have Washington out in San Francisco, and, and these, these are the ones who are getting double coverage, and that's why Qualic is doing so well this mm -hmm. year, I think. And you know, I think Hayes has four or five or maybe six or seven good years left, and I'd like to get out there while he's still getting double coverage. Uh, it'll make my job a lot easier. Is this uh, a campaign that you will go to Coach Landry with during the offseason, perhaps, or have you already? Well, not really. You know, I, I've joked around uh, Coach Renfro, but uh, you know, I've found in three years, if anything, that you can't campaign for one thing or another. Uh, as far as Coach Landry is concerned, he, he's a man of his, you know, has pretty strong will, and he has his mind made up. Uh, he'll have his mind made up in February, and regardless of what I say or do, uh, he's not going to veer from his his path. But uh, you know, it was mentioned last year, and I think last year I was against it because. You know, of the circumstances. Hopefully, I can do well at running back the remainder of the games, and then I would like to switch to tight end. I believe this district is conservative in nature. I believe the intelligent voter will look at the man rather than the party. And I believe with the Republican administration behind me, I will be able to do more for this district than a Democratic. Okay. 
if I win the suit, I believe that uh, anybody, any attorney in Dallas County can file for any county or district office, and in the office I'm filing for, Justice of the Peace, uh, any individual within that justice district will be able to file for that office, which I think in a democratic society is the just and proper thing to do. So what you're looking for is an actual abolishment of filing fees altogether? I think you could have a filing fee as the city council has, a $50 filing fee, or perhaps a, in a judicial office as district judge, you could have a $300 filing fee, which is the filing fee for your legislative offices. But I see no justification for a filing fee of $3,500 to $6,000 for a district office when the filing fee for governor is set at $1,000. Pretty much it. Oh, court, Jerry, any time you lose three in a row uh, like we did, you're disappointed. Uh, but we didn't play well enough to win, uh, really. We played well in spots and in spurts, but we really didn't put a complete game together, and this is what we have to do. What are some of the bright spots, the plus factors now? Well, of course, uh, Triplett has played well for us. He shot the basketball pretty well, and he's been on the boards uh, for us. Uh, his defense has been spotty. Uh, other than that, uh, we haven't shot the basketball well at all. Uh, we've got some kids that shot between 45 and 50 percent last year that are shooting around 30 percent. And uh, if we can shoot, uh, improve our shooting, why, well, it'll make us a better basketball team. And I think everything will work out fine. Well, Jerry, certainly we are happy to be in Dallas. Uh, we played SMU now for some 10 or 12 years, and it's been a good series. It's an unusual one. They seem to get us every time here, and we return the favor when they come to Atlanta. I hope this is a trip that we can break the jinx. What type of club are you bringing with you this trip? We have a ball club that uh, individually the boys are going real good as an individual. Uh, we don't have uh, the talent, the team that we had like last year. We lost three starters. We lost Rich Yonkers and Jim Thorne and Tommy Wilson. And uh, there's just no way from this group that we can replace either of those boys. Now we have the other two starters back, uh, Peanut Murphy and Frank Samoylo. But uh, we are lacking in the other spots and uh, we're a real young ball club. And right now, we're looking better than we've looked any time since practice started in October. How is your height, Coach? Our height is just average. Uh, we're 6'4 and 6'6 six, uh, six at forward. Uh, we are 6'6 six, six at center, 6'2 six, and 6 feet at guards. And when we substitute, uh, we come in with comparable height, uh, about the same for the boy going out as uh, the one coming in. Evan. Well, I think based on the questions that the justices asked, I think that uh, it was favorably received. And I believe that if the court will reach the merits, that the results will be favorable to our side. Assuming for a moment that, it, that the court rules against you, what other actions are possible? That simply depends upon what the court's ruling is. They can simply avoid the, the question on the merits uh, by uh, make, making certain procedural decisions, in which case we might have an uh, appeal then in the Fifth Circuit and still might ultimately reach the Supreme Court via the Fifth Circuit, or they might decide, reach the merits, but make a very narrow legalistic decision which uh, uh, might uh, leave some of the broader questions unanswered. So is, there is a chance that uh, even if the Supreme Court does rule on the case that it might not totally answer the question? Yes, I'm afraid there is. a great chance to get with young people and we over at Fireside Lodge have enjoyed the Christmas spirit so much that we hope that we can bring some of the Christmas spirit with us. Do you feel that this will mean as much to you as it does the children? 
I think it perhaps will mean more because these children are so delightful and it's lovely to get with them and be with them. It, it means a lot to get to see, see these children enjoy themselves. So many, they don't have the, the parents, well, they, they, their school, they don't have any parents. Well, some of them have parents, but they're not able to take care of them and they don't get anything for Christmas. And it means a whole lot to just see these kids enjoy themselves to me. Will this make this Christmas mean more to you? Sure, sure.